All right, if you have your Bible, I'd like for you to turn to a couple of passages of Scripture. I'm going to start this morning by listing a whole bunch of verses, so you, you won't want to try and turn to those. There are just so many of them so fast that I'm going to go through. But if you'll get ahead of me and go to 2 Timothy chapter 3, and eventually I'm going to make my way over to Ephesians chapter 5, all right? So those would be two places for you to turn this morning. Grateful that you brought your Bible with you today. We're in a brand new series today, and uh, it's all about thankfulness all about thankfulness. And so you'll see, actually the sermon title is right behind me. It's you Christio, and uh, that is the title. That's actually the word for thanks. It's the word for being thankful. And we're in a season right now where uh, we always think about thanksgiving. We always think about being thankful around this time of the year. But for the believer, thankfulness ought to be a part of our life every day, every moment, all the time. I mean, we just ought to be thankful people about everything that happens around us. And so today, specifically, I'm going to talk about thankfulness, and you'll understand this better as we get into the message, but I've titled today's specific sermon as, It's All About Grace. It's all about grace. You'll understand how grace and thankfulness work together here in a moment. So uh, first of all, let's talk about the Apostle Paul for a second. The Apostle Paul, again, remember, uh, there was something that the Apostle Paul understood about thankfulness that maybe if we really would get a hold of it, it would change our life. And uh, so I want you to be able to see that. And so Paul does something, I would call it the pattern of scripture. And so Paul, Paul wrote more of the New Testament than any other writer in the New Testament. He wrote more of the scriptures. He wrote Genesis, excuse me, not Genesis. I don't know where I got that from. Romans, 1st, 2nd Corinthians, Galatians, Ephesians, Philippians, uh, Colossians, Uh, So he wrote tons of books in the New Testament, lots and lots of books that he wrote. And so there was something in the pattern of it. There is, there's a pattern that's in the scripture that Paul wrote that I want to see if you notice it. Okay. There's something that happens here. And I think we, sometimes we read over things because we'll read, we'll read the whole book, which is good. I want you to read the whole book, but we'll read, we won't take into account. What is Paul doing? There's some, there's a pattern that Paul does over and over and over again as he writes that really should change our life. I want you to see it with me, okay? See if you notice it. I'm going to read these for you. Romans chapter 1. Again, notice all these are coming from chapter 1. So Romans chapter 1 verse 8. First, I thank my God through Jesus Christ for all of you that your faith is spoken of throughout the whole world. 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 4. I thank my God always concerning you for the grace of God which was given to you by Christ Jesus. Ephesians chapter 1, verse 16. Do not, I do not cease to give thanks for you, making mention of you in my prayers. Philippians chapter 1. I thank my God upon every remembrance of you. Colossians chapter 1. We give thanks to God and Father, our Lord Jesus Christ, all, praying always for you. 1 Thessalonians chapter 1, we give thanks to God always for you, making mention of you in our prayers. 2 Thessalonians chapter 1, we are bound to thank God always for you, brethren, as it is fitting, because your faith grows exceedingly, and the love of every one of you all abounds towards each other. I want you to just notice, does anyone see a pattern that the Apostle Paul starts every book, he, every time he begins to write, he always starts with thankfulness. There's something about thankfulness. And this verse says, I'm bound to it. I don't, I don't have a choice in it. I must thank God. I'm bound to be a thankful person. First Timothy chapter 1, verse 12 says, And I thank Christ Jesus our Lord who has enabled me because he counted me faithful, putting me into the ministry. 2 Timothy chapter 1, verse 3, I thank God whom I serve with a pure conscience as my forefathers did. Okay, well, I want you to just notice. Here's what he said. In the same way that our forefathers did this. Let me say it another way. In the same way that they did this in the Old Testament. Should be the same way that we're still doing this today. This new pattern that you're seeing in Paul's life is not a new pattern. It's the same as the old pattern. Notice that. I thank God whom I serve with a pure conscience as my forefathers did. And how did he do it? As without ceasing. I remember you in my prayers night and day. And he just never stopped. Just never stopped. Just want to thank God. I'm bound to this. And I do it without ceasing. And this is not a new pattern. This is an old pattern. You can see it all the way in the book of Genesis, all the way through the book of Revelation. The pattern is a pattern and a lifestyle of being a thankful person, having thankfulness in your life. 
Philemon chapter four, or excuse me, verse four says, I thank my God making mention of you always in my prayers. Verse four, I thank God always. I cannot say it enough. God's pattern for the believer's life is to learn to be a thankful person. I know what someone's going to say, but pastor, you don't know what I'm having to go through. You don't know the hardships that I'm having to face. You don't know the trouble that I have in my life. Okay, listen, I need you to understand something. God never said, never promised you a bed of roses. He never said you wouldn't have difficulty. In fact, he actually said, Jesus said himself, in this world you'll have trouble. But take heart, I've overcome the world. So listen, someone says, but I, I don't like having to go through the hard times. And what do we like to do? We like to pray, God, remove the hard things, remove the difficult things. God, I don't want to have to go through this. Okay, do you not know that the things that you're going through, the hardships, the difficulties, the struggles, are producing something in you? They're producing character. They're, they're producing faithfulness. They're, produce, they're making you into the person that God wants you to be. Okay. Uh, how many of you would say, God, take away your peace from my life. God, take away your comfort in my life. God, take away the character you're building in my life. None of us. But we'll ask God to take away the problems. Your problems, God placed there on purpose to make you into the person that you are today. So when I say, be thankful in all things, listen, I'm saying to you, you ought to learn to be thankful in the trouble. Be thankful in the hard times. Be thankful for what you're having to go through right now where God's trying to produce something in you that he can't produce any other way than to bring something into your life that you're having to face. And I know some of you face some hard times. I know some of you have lost children. And that's hard, that's difficult. But God allowed that in your life because the Bible says he works all things for, together for good. You say, well, that wasn't good. No, but he's working it together for good so that you can... He can produce something in you that he couldn't produce any other way. And what's our responsibility? To be bound, to be thankful in every area. I want you to just to notice this word that's behind us that's on the screen, Eucharistos. I want you to notice that word because God is trying to use this word, a word of thankfulness in there. I want you to see if you notice something about that word here in a moment. So point one, there is a pattern in scripture. Point two, do you know why there's a pattern of thankfulness in scripture? Do you understand why he has done that? Let me show you real quick, 2 Timothy chapter three. I hope you have your Bibles and you'll look at this. I used this very verse a few weeks ago in church, but I didn't really bring out all the parts of it. And I just wanna bring out something that's in the middle of it. He says that there's something that you need to understand about the last days. He says, know this, that in the last days, perilous times will come. Do you know that uh, life is going to get harder? Uh, listen to me, believers, because you know, I need some of you to understand. Some of you think it's going to get easier. It doesn't get easier. It gets harder. Perilous times are coming. Difficult times are coming. Uh, Paul was able to be a thankful person, even as he wrote some of these letters while he was in prison. I thank God I'm in prison. I thank God. I, I cannot say it enough how important it is to learn to be thankful even in perilous times, difficult times. Verse two says, for men will be lovers of themselves, lovers of money, boasters, proud, blasphemers, disobedient to parents. Do you notice something about this list? That all of these things that he mentions in this list are sins. Do y'all see it? Shake your head or something so I know you're alive. I just need to make sure we're not in a funeral home this morning, all right? Notice he says disobedient, to, that's a sin. Being disobedient to parents is a sin. Okay, notice this next one. Unthankful, unholy. These are sin, okay. Have you ever thought about having a lack of thankfulness is a sin? Why? Because we're bound as believers to be thankful in all situations that we're in. Okay, unthankful, unholy, unloving, unforgiving. Slanderers, without self-control, brutal, despisers of good, traitors, headstrong, haughty, lovers of pleasure rather than lovers of God, having a form of godliness, but denying its power, and from such people turn away. Okay, listen, I, I think, again, it's interesting the last line there says they have a form of godliness, but denying the power thereof. I think what he's trying to tell us is that these things are going to be happening within the church. And he's saying that they're just be people just, they're ungrateful. They're just unthankful. Now, if I were to break down that word for you, talking about unthankful, again, 
Notice that word eucharistos behind you there, but I want you to think about it like this. The word for unthankful there is the word acharistos. Okay, let me help you with it just a little bit so that you understand. That's the Greek word, acharistos. Uh, again, think about words like this. Think about the word symmetry. If I were to say something ha- is symmetrical, what do I mean by that? It's, it's got a pattern to it and it's got symmetry to it and it, all the sides are even on it. But if I were to say that something is asymmetrical, what would that mean? It would mean without symmetry, right? So w- there's some things that happens in the English language that happen in the Hebrew language that actually we've carried on into English today. And so a lot of times when you add the letter A in front of something, you're actually saying it's without. So if I say it is asymmetrical, I'm saying it's without symmetry. Are y'all with me on that? Okay, uh, let me say it a different way. Uh, if I use the word atheist, okay, if I just break that down real quick, what's a theist? A theist is someone who believes there is a God. What's an atheist? It's someone without God. Are y'all with me on that? Okay, so notice this word, unthankfulness, is the word achristos. Okay, what does that mean? It is someone that is without thankfulness. But there's a part to this that if you're not careful, you'll miss it. And it's, I think, you know, there's some Greek words that I think every Christian ought to know. I just really do. I'm not, I can't, I'm not going to teach you Greek on every single level, but I promise you there's some words that you just should just know, like the word koinonia. Does anyone know the word koinonia? Okay, anyone know what koinonia means? Fellowship. Uh, or the word agape. Does anyone know what the word agape is? Love. Okay, so y'all see you do know some Greek, right? Well, here's a word every Christian should know. It's the word charis. Charis, okay? Uh, by the way, it's actually the word that we get in the English for charismatic. Anyone ever heard of a charismatic? Okay, uh, where are my charismatics in the room? Let me see your hand real quick. Okay, let me help you. You know what, you know what a charismatic is? Charis is the word for grace. A charismatic is all obsessed about the grace of God. Where are my charismatics in the room? Are you obsessed with the grace of God? Charis. By the way, we all should be obsessed with the grace of God. Every one of us, charis. Because, listen, grace is is the ability to get something that you did not deserve. Uh, It is getting heaven's gifts uh, even though you did not deserve them. It is getting the love of the Father poured out on you even though you didn't deserve them. We live in a society today that if I were to ask people, why should God let you into my kingdom? We have a lot of people that say, well, because I'm pretty good. I'm, I'm kind of curious about how many people one day will stand before the Father and he'll say to them, why should I let you into my kingdom? And they'll say to him, I'm, well, if, Lord, you should let me in because I'm a good person. Okay, here's why you think you're a good person. Because you've looked at someone else, your neighbor or a friend, and think to yourself, well, I'm better than them. Okay, listen, but God never said, my standard for letting you into heaven is your neighbor. God's standard for letting you into his kingdom, listen to me, is himself. You can't get into heaven if your righteousness is not the same as that of Jesus Christ. Well, that's bad news. Because I can't be as righteous as Jesus. Anyone agree with me on that? I cannot be as righteous as him. So grace steps in. Grace is getting something that you do not deserve. That's the reason why in Romans chapter five, verse one, it says, having believed, we have been justified. Okay, listen, what does the word justified mean? Justified means declared righteous. When I put faith in Jesus, I say, Lord, I'm trusting you. I'm not gonna be good enough. I'll never be good enough. God says, oh, you're gonna trust me for your faith? You're gonna trust me for your righteousness? You're gonna trust me for heaven? Well, right now, and he declares with his mouth, well, then I declare you to be righteous. Not because of you're good enough, but I'm putting my goodness on you so that I'll see my goodness when you come before me in my kingdom. Why should I let you into my kingdom? I'll tell you why. Because I wasn't good enough, but you were. And I trusted in that. That's the grace of God. Listen to me. We all ought to have a little charismatic in us. To be with grace. To be obsessed with grace. I want you to be obsessed with the grace of God. Listen, the reason why Paul could be thankful, I want you to think about this. Why was Paul so thankful for the situation that he was in? Think about this. Uh, Paul, uh, you remember how Paul addresses himself? 
Paul, Paul does, he, he says, well, I'm an apostle of Jesus, but think about it another way. He says it like this. I was the least of all the apostles. You know why he calls himself the least of all the apostles? Because before he became a believer in Jesus Christ, he hated people who believed in Jesus. He hated people who had found grace with God. And so he would go around torturing Christians. He would go around putting to death Christians. He would lock them in prison and, and, and throw away the keys and say, you're never getting out of this cell whatsoever. And then one day, Jesus found Paul on the road to Damascus and said to him, Paul, Paul, why are you persecuting me? Paul says, I wasn't persecuting you. But when you persecuted one of his, you persecuted him. Paul, why are you persecuting me? That day, Paul met Jesus. And you know what Paul knew about himself? He knew that he had killed, he had, he had murdered, he had tortured, he had placed in prison Christians. And he knew he didn't deserve the love of God. He knew he didn't deserve to be unto heaven. But when he put faith in God, he got grace for his situation. You know what grace will do for you? Grace will make you more thankful. Just think about this. Don't think about acharistos. You know what it means? It really means to be without grace. You know why people are, have a lack of thankfulness in their life? Because they're living their life like they have no grace. Listen to me. Every one of you have been received. You have been accepted by Jesus Christ when you've put your faith in him. Amen. You have something to be thankful for like really thankful for, because none of you were going to heaven without the grace of God. We needed his grace. So I'm just telling you, point number two there, again, do you know why, the pat, why there is a pattern for thankfulness in scripture? It's so that you will understand. If you understood Paul was thankful, he's thankful, he's thankful, he's thankful, you'll understand why he's thankful, because he's been included in on grace that he did not deserve. Every one of us had that same thing. Well, here's, here's the third point today, and that is, what does a grace-filled life look like? Because I'm, I'm convinced that God wants us to have a grace-filled life. Paul lived a grace-filled life, not because he felt like he deserved it, but he lived a grace-filled life because he knew he didn't deserve it. And so therefore, he wanted to spend the rest of his life being a thankful person. Ephesians chapter 5, verse 18. I hope you'll turn there and look with me. Ephesians chapter 5, verse 18. I want you to notice this is what it means to have a grace-filled life. He says in verse 18, and do not be drunk with wine in which is dissipation, but be filled with the spirit. How many of you would like to be filled with the spirit? Boy, I do. I want to I walk a life filled with the spirit of God, with the presence of God. Well, how do we do that? Notice the rest of it. Verse 19, speaking to one another in psalms and hymns, and spiritual songs, singing and making melody in your heart to the Lord, giving thanks always when everything goes well and you have no problems. Y'all are taking a long time to figure out if that's what it says. Is that what it says? I'm telling you, you got to pay attention, making sure you're still awake. Because he didn't say, when everything goes good, give thanks always. What he said was, give thanks always for all things. That would include all bad things and difficult things and all the struggles that you have in your life. To God the Father, in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. I want you to just think with me for just a second. Here's what, here's what Paul said, what it means to be, have a spirit-filled life. When everything seems to be going wrong, when everything seems to be difficult, you learn to live a thankful life. Yes. Let me help you in some direction with that. Um, next time you're in the restaurant, this afternoon, you're going to go to a restaurant. Some of you are going to get some bad service because we live kind of in a society now where it just seems like everything has bad service to it. Have y'all noticed this? Okay. Rather than sitting around complaining about the bad service, here's what you don't know. What you don't know is what that server has had to go through in their own life right then. How about we become the Christians that God has called us to and be bound to be thankful, just to say, Lord, I thank you. How about take a moment and look at that waitress and say, hey, listen, we're going to be praying here in a moment for our meal. How can we pray for you? Thank you for serving us today. Thank you for blessing us today. Yeah, I know it took you 20 minutes to bring my tea over here, but thank you <laughs> that I finally got tea. It's awesome. Thank you. 
You know, I, I know I requested a lemon for my tea, but you brought me an onion. Thank you. It's okay. I mean, I, what does it really hurt to learn to be a thankful individual for things? Listen, the reason you're thankful is because you come to the place where you realize I've been filled with grace. I can be gracious to other people. Paul, who murdered Christians, learned how to be thankful to God that he's living this grace-filled life now. And by the way, just notice it changes your language, speaking to one another in psalms and hymns. You just learn how to speak to people in a different way. You just learn how to do that because you're a thankful person. What does a grace-filled life look like? Colossians, with me. Look with me. Colossians chapter one. Look down to verse nine. For this reason, we also, since the day we heard of it, we do not cease to pray for you and to ask that you may be filled with the knowledge of his will and all wisdom and spiritual understanding. He's saying, I want you to be able to walk a spirit-filled life. And we thank God constantly that we've been filled with wisdom and understanding. Thank you, God, for what you have done and that you may walk worthy of the Lord, full, fully pleasing him, being fruitful in every good work and increasing in the knowledge of God. He's saying, because of this grace that we have, uh, we can learn how to please God as we walk in this thankful life that we have. Verse 11, strengthened with all might according to his glorious power. Notice these two words, for all patience and long suffering with joy. Notice those two words, because here's what we like to think. Well, if everything's going good, everything's gonna be okay, we're not gonna have any problems. But he says, we've had to learn how to do this with patience. Listen to me. You don't need patience when everything's going good. Long suffering. Listen, isn't it interesting? He says patience and long suffering with joy. Because I'm just saying to you, sometimes when you're going through struggles and trials and difficulties, we don't want to be patient with people and we don't want to be long suffering with them. But because of the grace of God, we learn with joy to be thankful. Thank you, God, even in this. Even this struggle that I'm having to face with me, myself right now in this life. And then notice the very next word, words, verse 12. Giving thanks to the Father who has qualified us. That's grace. You didn't qualify yourself. You were never that good. It's when you get to the place by with grace that you go, thank God he qualified me. I was unqualified to go to heaven, but thanks be unto God who has qualified me to be a partaker of the inheritance of the saints in the light. He has delivered us from the power of darkness. Anyone thankful for that? Yes. And conveyed us into the kingdom of his son, of the son of his love, in whom we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of sins. Here's, here's what he's saying. Uh, he's saying re, the word redemption there is the word that you've been bought, you've been redeemed, you've been bought with a price. Listen to me. Every one of us, because of the blood of Jesus, have been bought with a price. The price was his own death so that we could enter into redemption, be saved through the blood of Jesus Christ. And if you really want to know what that means, it means that you were forgiven of all your sins. Okay, listen to me. Where are my sinners in the room today? How many of you are grateful, thankful that you've been redeemed, bought with a price through the blood of Jesus? I'm telling you, I'm thankful for that. And, and what it means is I've been forgiven. I don't know what you've done. Some of you in this room, I know some of you, you're saying to yourself, you, don't, you just don't understand, Pastor, how bad I've been. You don't know how, how difficult of life that it's been. Uh, I don't know how God could ever forgive me. You know what? I don't know how God could forgive Paul, but he did. He murdered. I'm saying to you, if you're here today, God has forgiven you of all unrighteousness through the blood of Jesus. Accept it and thank God for it. God, thank you that you've forgiven me. Thank you that I can walk in this life. It's a grace-filled life. Thank you, God, for what you've done for me. <coughs> Philippians chapter four, verse four says, rejoice in the Lord always. I'll say it again, rejoice. See, you, you can't even come to the joy-filled life till you get to the place where you're like, I'm going to do this always. It's just going to be a part of my life. It's going to be the new habit of my life to learn how to rejoice in all circumstances, in all difficulty, in all struggles. Because I know that the things that God is bringing in my life is producing something in me. It's making me more like him. Let your gentleness be known to all men. Why? Because the Lord's at hand. I don't know if you know this or not, but I think we live close. I don't know when the Lord's coming back. But he says, let your gentleness be known. 
Let, let your, you know what we like to do? We like to let our anxiety be known. What do you think you're doing, doing the tailgating me down the road? Listen, I'm saying we've got to put that behind us now and let a gentle spirit, a quiet spirit, a thankful spirit guide our hearts, guide our lives, no matter what it is that we face in our life. He says, be anxious for nothing. That's a good word for us today. Listen to me. I know the Lord's coming back. I know times are going to get hard. I know it's going to get more difficulty, but listen to me. You don't have to be afraid. Be anxious for nothing. You don't have to worry. God's got you. He's got you. Pastor, I'm going through some hard times. I know, but God's got you. He's got every circumstance. He's already thought this out. He knows exactly where he's leading you. He knows what kind of person that he's trying to produce. But in everything by prayer and supplication, here's what he's saying. When you're feeling anxious, just tell me about it. God, right now, I'm I'm struggling with something. I'm having a hard time. So God, would you just know that what I'm going through right now I don't always act the way that I should, but God, continue to produce it in me. Continue to make me the man or the woman that you've called me to be. And then notice this, with thanksgiving, God, thank you that you've caused me to have to suffer a little bit. It's nothing in comparison with other, what other Christians have had to suffer. So God, thank you for this. Thank you for this trial that's in my life right now. Thank you for this difficulty. Let your request be made known to God. And then this is the part we've all been looking for. Because do you know the Bible says that we enter his gates with thanksgiving? Do you know that the Bible tells us, listen, you know what that means? The more thankful we are, the more that we enter into his presence. If I were to ask you today, how many of you'd like to be in the presence of God? I bet every one of us, yes, I want to be in the presence of God. I, aren't you grateful to come to a church where you have the presence of the Lord? Aren't you grateful for that? But let me ask you this. How would you like to go home today and in your home, with your marriage, with your kids, how would you like to have the presence of God? Would you like that? Where you don't just have to experience it at church, but you can experience it at home or on your job. Would you like to have the presence of God in your job? How do we do that? We enter his gates, the presence of the Lord, with thanksgiving. We go in, we become thankful people. God says, I love being around thankful people. Have you ever met someone who's just over the top thankful about everything? They're fun to be around. God likes to be around you too when you're thankful. You want the presence of God. We have to learn to be a thankful people. And verse seven says, and here's what happens when we learn to walk like this, when we begin to walk in the spirit this way. This is what a grace-filled life looks like. And the peace of God in the midst of all those struggles and all those problems and all those difficulties, the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding. I can't figure out why I'm even peaceful right now because of this and this and this and this. Everything seems like it's crashing down around me, but the peace of God, which passes my understanding to understand why I'm so peaceful in this moment, guards my heart and my mind through Christ Jesus. So you know what he's saying? I'm right with you. My presence is right there. You can have that. I've been, I've been thinking a lot this week about, I've just noticed how, you know, have you ever noticed how some people just seem to be more joyous, more thankful? We have a young man who's been attending our church for some time now, and God's done an incredible work in his life. Some of you, I don't know if you know him or not, he's actually sitting right over here. Wave your hand for us, Logan. This is Logan. I actually talked to him this week and asked if I could tell this story. Uh, Logan, we have here in Athens a a home for men who've gotten caught into different addictions and different things in their life, and Logan was there. He was at Lila Lane. And uh, while he was there, he started coming to church here, and God got a hold of Logan here at church. And some things you need to know, Logan was legally blind, could never get a driver's license, was going to have a hard time ever being able to get to work anywhere. He started coming to church here. God, God, not Life Fellowship, God got a hold of Logan. God found Logan right where he was at. And Logan gave his life to Jesus, saved him. (laughs) 
You probably didn't know you knew Logan, but if you've ever been in any of our services, every now and then in a worship service, you'll hear Logan just shout, just right in the middle of service. It'd just be, you know, if you're not ready for it, it'll scare you. Just right in the middle of service, he'll go, woo! You don't want to know why Logan's like that? Because when God set him free, God did a healing work on his eyes. He's no longer legally blind, but with glasses. With glasses, he has 20-20 vision now. He has his driver's license. He has a job. He's been set free. He's got a wife. That's a new set of problems. Amen. (laughs) Here's what I want you to understand. The reason Logan gets so excited about the Lord is because he understands how much he's been set free from. The reason some of us don't get excited about the Lord, the reason why some of us kind of We're thankful, but we just, uh, you know, God knows I'm thankful. It's because we don't know how much God has set us free from. We don't understand that all we, like sheep, have gone astray. We've all turned everyone to their own way. But the Lord laid the iniquity of us all on Jesus so that he could pay the price for every one of us. You've been set free because you've invited Jesus in your heart. We are, listen to me, if you would just understand that you're full of the grace of God. I don't know what you've done. Some of you probably think I'm pretty good. Your goodness is not good enough. The reality is we're all pretty bad. And we needed a savior named Jesus. And when you turn your life over to him, It'll make you more of a thankful person than you've ever been before. Can I pray for you? Would you just bow your heads and close your eyes for a moment? We like to ask this question at the end of every message, and that is, what is the Holy Spirit saying to you? Would you just ask him, God, what are you saying to me? I've got another question for you today. It's a different question. We always ask, what's the Holy Spirit saying to you? But my question for you is, what are you saying to the Holy Spirit? Would you take a moment right now and tell the Lord, thank you. Thank you for setting me free. Thank you for rescuing me. Some of you may need to tell the Lord, God, forgive me for not being a thankful person, for being a humble person. Just tell the Lord, God, I want to be like Paul and walk in all of your grace. Learn to be thankful in all situations, to bless your holy name. Maybe you're here today and you've never met this Jesus that we're talking about. You hear me talking about it. But see, there's something that has to happen in your life. You need Jesus to save you. And he's calling you right now. He's saying, why don't you come to me? I'll I'll change your life forever, but you're gonna have to come to me. You're gonna have to trust me. Maybe you're here today and you're like, pastor, how, how do I do that? How do I invite Jesus in my life? You can do it right where you're seated right now. You can say a prayer that's just like this. And I would encourage you to do this. Just say these words, mean them from your heart and talk to the Lord about it. Just say, dear Jesus, right where you're seated, dear Jesus, confess before you right now that I'm a sinner and that I need you. I'll never be good enough to get into your kingdom without you. So God, today, Would you cleanse me of all of my sins? Would you wash me and make me brand new? And Father, thank you for giving us Jesus. And Jesus, thank you for dying for my sins. 
And Father, thank you for raising Jesus from the dead. Proving to us that you have the power over death. And if you have the power over death, you certainly have the power to grant me new life. So today, I make you the Lord of my life. I will live for you for the rest of my days, Master. And I will walk a grace-filled life. Thank you, Jesus. Just take a moment. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you for setting me free. Thank you, God. Thank you. Now, with no one looking around, I'm not going to call you out. I'm not going to embarrass you. But if you're in this room today, you say, Pastor, I prayed that prayer. I invited Jesus in my heart. And I want you to know about it. I want to pray for you. I'm not going to call you out, but I want to pray for you. If that's you, with all boldness, you prayed that prayer this morning, I want you to take your hand and slip it up nice and high. Put it up nice and high in the air. I'm going to pray for you. We're not going to call you out. But just hold your hand up nice and high so I can see you. Yes, over here to my right, I see you. Over on the far right, I see you. Amen. Amen. Here in the middle, towards the back, I see you. Yes. Over here on my left, I see you. Yes, way far over there, I see you. I'm praying for you. Amen. Now, in just a moment, when I finish saying this next prayer, there's going to be a team of people who are going to come here to the front. I want to encourage you to come. Put your hand in their hands. Just say, hey, I, today I invited Jesus in my heart, and I want you to know about it, Pastor. I want you to know about it, prayer leader. And let them pray over your life. And then they want to put some material in your hands to help you to take the next steps in your life with God. Now, this prayer time is not just for those who've received Jesus this morning. This prayer time is for everyone. So maybe you're struggling with a marriage situation. Can we pray for your marriage, for your home, for your kids, for the struggles that are in your life? The struggles can be real. We want to pray for you. We want to present those requests before God. And we want you to walk out of here today a gracious, thankful person, even in the struggles. So if you need prayer today, I want to invite you to come. Father God, we love you. You're great and holy and mighty. You are our way maker, our miracle worker. And we give you our hearts. We worship you today like we have never worshiped before. In spirit and truth, we worship you. From a very deep place, we worship you today. Come on, let's stand to our feet. Let's worship the Lord. Come on.